Good morning, everyone. Uh, I, th- I think I've told you before that I am uh, embarrassingly poor at geography, uh, much to the chagrin of my father, who is a walking map. Uh, <laughs> he knows everything. And so, but this has to be one of my more embarrassing stories about this. Um, when I was in college, uh, my best friend Travis lived in Aberdeen. And it was around this time of year, he invited me to uh, go to his place to hang out with his family and his friends there uh, to celebrate New Year's Day. And so I thought, well, that'd be kind of fun. You know, get to know, see Travis's world, get to know some of his friends and his family, the people that I'd heard him talking about. And so um, back then we didn't have smartphones, and I didn't have a GPS, and I wasn't using maps or anything. And so Travis just wrote out the directions for me to get to Aberdeen, right? And it's super simple. You go on to 29, and then you take exit, I even have to look here, 207, and then you go to US 12, and you head west on that road, right? Easy. So I thought, yeah, I'd definitely, I'd love to be able to go do this with you. And so, and, and this is the thing. Here's how my brain works. And it's gotten better, but I still do, I still think this way sometimes. Like, in my mind, I'm thinking, a couple of turns, it's probably like a 45-minute drive. No problem. <laughs> So I get into my car, and I start driving toward Aberdeen. And I, I'm looking at every single exit, just watching them like a hawk, because I also didn't realize how the numbering system on exits works. I just thought some person in power just randomly, ah, 207. I'll just, we'll just call it that. Um, and so I, I'm watching every single one going by, and, and I'm, I'm starting to get close to Brookings. And it's been 45 minutes, and I'm like, I, I think I might have missed my turn. But I thought, well, no, maybe, maybe I'm wrong. I'll just can't kind of keep going because I was estimating about how long it was going to take. But I started to get toward Watertown, and I'm, like, panicking. I'm like, I know I missed my turn back there. I'm such an idiot. Like, I should have I turned way back there somewhere. And so I pull off at a rest stop, and I'm looking at this map, and I'm, I'm retracing my steps on the map and thinking, I didn't miss my turn. Like, I don't even see it on here. And then I thought, could it be? that I need to drive even further than Watertown. And sure enough, I look and I had to. And so I'm like, well, at least I know that I'm going the right way. So I I was feeling a little bit more confident. And then I found my exit. And then it was like a light shining from heaven onto the sign. Hallelujah. And it said, Aberdeen. And it also said, 60 miles. And I'm like, what? What? Like this 45-minute drive that I thought I was going to have turned into a three-hour saga. Um, But that's just because that's the way that my brain works, right? Uh, But I share that story with you because that sign was so significant to me. Like as I was going on uh, the rest of the road, I I I felt anxiety. I felt panic. I felt directionless until I saw the sign. And the sign was pointing me in the right direction saying, you're almost there. You're almost at your destination. It's almost, you've almost arrived. Advent. And that's what we're talking about in this season of Advent. Last week, we talked about Advent being a time of waiting for peace, for God to bring peace to his world. And and for the Israelites before Jesus was born, uh, he brought peace into the world when Jesus came to this earth. They they finally received their long-awaited king uh, that was going to make things right and, and, and rescue them from their enemies. And now today, too, uh, we continue to wait for peace. Even though Jesus has been born, uh, we still live in a broken, hurting world. And we long for the day when Jesus is going to return and bring the fullness of his kingdom and put all things to right. So we talked about we're waiting for peace. And this week we're talking about waiting for a sign. And we've been going through the Gospel of Luke as we've been doing this. Um, And at the beginning of Luke's Gospel, no surprise, if you've been a Christian for a while, uh, we get the story of Jesus' birth. But also interwoven in that story of Jesus' birth is the story of John the Baptist's birth. Like all of the Gospels make a big deal about John the Baptist. In fact, Jesus himself said that of all the people who have ever lived, none is greater than John. And for Jesus to say that, that's a pretty big deal, right? Uh, So what was such a big deal about John is that he got to be the one to announce to the world the good news that, you know that king that you've been waiting for, Israel, for so long? Well, guess what? He's born. He's coming into this world. There's no more waiting. He's like the opening act at a rock concert, right? Where you get the whole audience all hyped up and ready for for the act that everybody really came there to see. Uh, He's like the sign that said Aberdeen on it. 
like where we've been just like wandering through this life, looking for a sign, looking for hope that it's going to happen. And he's saying, your destination, you're almost there. It's right around the corner because that Jesus Christ is born into this world. So prepare your hearts. Prepare him room. Prepare the way of the Lord. And that's what we talk about with John the Baptist. That's why we, we celebrate John the Baptist at Advent. Um, and there are lots of things that were special about uh, John the Baptist's life. Uh, when we're told about the story of his birth, uh, it was announced in a very miraculous way. You know, Gabriel, the angel, shows up to Zechariah. And even though he and his wife Elizabeth were very old, he sa- and they've been trying their whole lives to have a child. It's not happening. And this, uh, this angel announces to him, it's going to happen. And you're going to name him John. And Zechariah is like, well, uh, how am I going to know this is going to happen? And he's like, well, you're just going to be quiet for a little while until he's born. And you think about what you said there. Like, trust in the Lord. So there's all these miraculous things happening around John's birth. Uh, And then, not only that, but Luke tells us that the Holy Spirit was all over John, even before uh, he was born. Uh, And then when John is born, uh, all of the neighbors and and the friends and the family are gathered around. I mean, this is a pretty wild thing that's happening, because they've known Zechariah and Elizabeth for a long time now. And they knew how long they've been trying to have a child. And they know that they're too old to be having children anymore. I mean... And, and think about the other stories from the Old Testament that we know of uh, people who couldn't have children. Uh, and then later on in life, that it was announced to them that you are going to be able to have a child, right? Uh, we think especially of like Abraham and Sarah. Uh, that was a really significant thing uh, for them to be able to have a child. Like when they've been told, like, you're barren. Like, it's impossible. God's purposes aren't going to happen. Uh, but with human beings... Things are impossible, but with God, all things are possible. So this miraculous stuff surrounding John's birth. And the people are starting to wonder, because they're waiting for a Messiah, and they feel like this is right around the corner. Our king that's going to rescue us is coming. Could this be the one? Is this the one that we've been waiting for? But as great as John was, he was only the opening act. He, He was only the sign that was pointing to the main act that was yet to come. And that was Jesus Christ, the Messiah, the Savior, the Son of God, Emmanuel. He's coming. He's right around the corner. And Zechariah, at one point in Luke's gospel, is given this prophecy. And you can imagine Zechariah holding baby John as he's saying this. And he says this to him. And you, my little son, will be called the prophet of the Most High, because you will prepare the way for the Lord. You will tell his people how to find salvation through forgiveness of their sins. Because of God's tender mercy, the morning light from heaven is about to break upon us to give light to those who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death and to guide us to the path of peace. That's who John is. And Luke tells us that that John grew up And then he went and he lived in the wilderness until he did his public ministry in Israel. And then we don't hear about John until chapter 3, a little bit later. John's growing up and and all the prophecies about him at his birth are starting to take shape. Uh, He conducted his ministry around the Jordan River. And one of his, uh, the main message that he brought to the people was that he, people should be baptized to show that they've repented of their sins and turned to God and be forgiven because they're preparing their hearts for the way of the Lord, for this Messiah to enter into the world. And and this is the kind of stuff that the prophet Isaiah talked about hundreds and hundreds of years ago when he said this about John the Baptist, and he didn't even know it. He is a voice shouting in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord's coming, clear the road for him. The valleys will be filled and the mountains and the hills made level. The curves will be straightened and the rough places made smooth. And then all people will see the salvation that is from God. John John was like that sign, the Aberdeen sign, that was pointing to the destination that was to come, this Messiah that was going to come. But but to use a little bit more South Dakota imagery here, he's also like a snowplow, right? Just, you know how it is when it gets really nasty out there and we need some salt and you need that that, uh, snow plowed off the roads so that we can drive uh, more clearly on them, more carefully. This is exactly what he was doing and and preparing people for, but it wasn't moving snow. He was preparing people's hearts 
uh, to receive this Messiah, this one that's like Jesus Christ. That, you know, you used to be going this way, and uh, you used to live your life for yourself, but he was calling them to repent, which in the Bible means turn 180 degrees. Like, now you're not living by your own will anymore. You're living by the will of your Lord Jesus Christ and the way that he calls us to live in this world. Once we had our lives dedicated to taking life from other people, and now we're giving our lives to giving our lives for other people. And baptism was the initiation process into this new way of life, of saying yes to this. And as Paul talked about in uh, Romans chapter 6, when we're baptized, it's like that old, hard-hearted, rebellious side of us is laid down into the grave and we're raised back up into newness of life in Christ, filled with the power of the Holy Spirit, the same Spirit that filled and guided Jesus' ministry in this world. Uh, and, I, you know, I genuinely, genuinely appreciate other traditions that practice uh, infant baptism and sprinkling and whatnot. I, I think that, like, we Baptists have something to learn from them as well, too, with their theology of that. But I have to confess, I like the fact that when somebody says, I've decided to follow Jesus, that we just completely immerse them under the water and bring them back up. You know, because uh, baptism is a beautiful rite of passage with a person. Uh, where they say, you know, I'm not just changing a little bit of who I am. I'm not just the same person, and now I have some new, like, doctrines or new, uh, like, information that I'm cramming into my head in addition to what I already knew. Uh, but I'm becoming a whole new person. This is a whole new way of being in the world, and I'm giving my all to Jesus. Uh, and that's what Jocelyn did today when she was baptized. It's the same, I'm all in. Not just part of me, all of who I am. I'm pledging my allegiance to him and to him alone, and I'm going to allow Jesus to make me a new person into his likeness. And that's what John the Baptist was doing with his baptisms, was preparing people for Jesus to come into this world because this is what Jesus was going to be doing with other people too. He's going to be forgiving us, us of our sins indeed, but he's also inviting us to have a life that's empowered by the Spirit uh, and get rid of the sin and the destruction that it causes our relationships. That this kind of stuff no longer characterizes us. That, that it doesn't taste good to us anymore. And instead, uh, we develop a new palate, a new taste for Christ-like fruit in our lives. Where we're being transformed in that direction. In a way of love and mercy and tenderness and forgiveness in this world. And this really is truly good news for the rest of the world. Because Jesus' way is the true way to live. It's what we were created for. Uh, we were made to live at peace with God and with our fellow human beings. And peace is brought about through people who have repented of their unchristlike ways and surrendered to the Spirit and bear Christ-like fruit in their lives. Um, I skipped over. I realized what I was going to talk about here too. So I'm going to come back to this, but it's all going to fit together, right? Because this is important, all right? We're getting into chapter 3 when we see John the Baptist doing his thing. Uh, and John the Baptist is kind of intense, all right? Listen to what he has to say here. Luke 3, uh, 7 through 14. It says, When the crowds came to John for baptism, he said, You brood of snakes! Who warned you to flee from the coming wrath? Prove by the way that you live that you have repented of your sins and turned to God. Other versions say, bear fruits worthy of repentance. Okay, like you've turned your life around. Is there evidence of it? Do we see it? He said, don't just say to each other, we're safe. We're descendants of Abraham. You know, because that's what it would have been like for the Jewish people. They would have said, yeah, I've been Jewish all my life. My family's got this long heritage that goes all the way back to Abraham. I go to synagogue, you know, and, and today if you were speaking to us, you could say, you know, I prayed the sinner's prayer. I've been baptized. I go to church. I read my Bible. I pray. You know, I'm good. But he says that that means nothing. Um, gosh, I'm all over the place here. That means nothing, for I tell you. God can create children of Abraham from these very stones. Even now the axe of God's judgment is poised and ready to sever the root of the trees. Yes, every tree that does not bear good fruit will be chopped down and thrown into the fire. Whew! 
Like, that's kind of heated stuff, you know, that's like some hellfire and damnation kind of stuff, you know, that we don't talk about a whole lot here in church, but, but kind of like the way that John's talking here. And John was a fiery person, right? Like, he got in all sorts of trouble with King Herod because uh, King Herod married his brother's wife, and John publicly criticized him, and that got him thrown in prison, and eventually he'd be beheaded for that sort of thing. Like, John was an intense person. Uh, in fact, I remember one time somebody sent or showed me like a picture. If John the Baptist had a Christmas card, it might look something like this. If we have that picture there. Merry Christmas, you brood of vipers. <laughs> Love John the Baptist. Uh, he, he was intense. And, and it seems like what John is saying is harsh. All right. But I think what John is inviting us into is actually very beautiful. He's saying don't let your religion justify your fleshly, angry way of life, okay? Like, we're going to give our hearts over to something new, something that's Christ-like, something that brings life into the rest of the world. Uh, and that's what John the Baptist was inviting us into. Um, and at the very beginning of Luke's gospel, what we see is that this was totally new. Nobody had heard this stuff before. No, nobody had heard that, that Jesus was going to enter the world in the way that he did. Um, but now, today, we have the benefit of hindsight, that we know that Jesus has been born into this world. And the result of that is that he's poured out his spirit on us. Through baptism, he said, you're going to be my people in this world. And, and we're like little John the Baptist who have been scattered all around this world, who are, serve as signs in the rest of the world, pointing to the one that's greater than us, that has a beautiful vision of his kingdom coming in this world and taking over. And we get to invite other people to say, you are so close to your destination. He's right there. The kingdom is among us. And I marvel at the fact that we get to do this um, every week at youth group with our young people. Uh, with, with these children that I think that so many times they come from a world uh, that's very, very broken uh, and directionless. And, and that's not their fault. It's kind of what we've handed to them. Because we older people, we like making lots of money and making iPads and iPhones and, and giving them to people that we know are going to be addicted to them. And it's going to cause a bunch of anxiety and, and directionlessness in life. And so I think sometimes we see a lot of young people who, who are like on that road to Aberdeen, but they, they don't know where the sign is. And it's such a beautiful thing to be like John the Baptist, to be like signs in their life through the way that we love them and the way that we commit ourselves to them and the way that we testify to Jesus to them to say, come, let us adore him together. Like, let, let's go see this Jesus because he will change your life. He's everything that you're looking for. He's the destination that you're after. And it's not just a youth group too. All of you get to be signs. You all get to be little John the Baptist that are scattered all about in your little realms of influence with the people that you work with and your families and your friends. Uh, that, you know, we live in a world, as Zechariah prophesied, that it's like, it's like we live in darkness and the shadow of death. This is a hurting place to live, isn't it? But the good news is that the sun is rising and it's bringing light and life and color and beauty into a world full of death and darkness and violence. Do you want to be part of that too? We get to be the signs that point to that because that's what Jesus is doing here in this world. And our baptism is our initiation into this new kingdom, into this new way of life. It's our way of saying, I'm all in with you, Jesus. Like, take not just part of me, all of me, all of who I am. I pledge my allegiance to you. I will follow you. I will give my life to you. And so that's like the initiation process into the Christian life. Uh, but then there's another process along the way that we call communion. And communion is kind of the ongoing process of our witness to the fact that we have said yes to this Jesus way in the world. Uh, because in the same way that Jesus allowed his body to be broken for us and his blood to be poured out for us, I mean, it's that kind of sacrifice that allows broken people like you and me to belong to his kingdom. And to be able to sit with him at his table. And you know what he says to us, his church? Go and do likewise. 
All right? Like, through, through the waters of baptism, we lay down that old part of who we used to be. And we're raised back to a new way of life. It's a whole new way of looking at God. It's a new way of relating to God. It's a new way of relating to our fellow human beings where we say, God's table is open to you. God's kingdom is open to you. You, Anybody who wants to come to Jesus can come to know him. Even the tax collectors. Even the most broken people and the most despised people of this world today are welcome into his kingdom. And you know, when we practice communion... When we fellowship with God and with one another in this new way, uh, we are preparing the way of the Lord, just as John the Baptist did. Because you know what's going to happen? Jesus is bringing his kingdom into this world. It's going to happen. But what's it going to look like when it does? It means that love is going to take over this world. Christ-like love where reconciliation is going to happen in a complete and full way. And Jesus' prayer for unity among his people is going to become a reality. This is what it happens, what happens when Jesus' way happens, that, that, that we're reconciled to God, we're also reconciled to our fellow human beings. And when we practice communion together, we're preparing the way of the Lord. Because when he shows up, is he going to find a church that's ready for him because we've been practicing that unity? Even if it's with people that we wish we'd rather not be eating at a table with. um, Because that's the way he does it. We're learning to love one another. The way that he's called us to. And that's what we celebrate when we celebrate communion. We're preparing our hearts for Jesus to come into this world. And to bring the fullness of his kingdom. Because we're already practicing it now. Amen? Amen. So so here's how we do communion here. If you're not familiar with it. Um, We do what's called intinction. There are people standing at the back. Uh, and if you, uh, at some point during the final song here, uh, you'll go and you'll take the bread and you'll dip it into the cup uh, and you can return back to your seat. And if you need prayer during this time too, we'll have some people over here at the north wall. Uh, they can say a prayer for you. Uh, but in the meantime, let me say a prayer over all of us as we go into communion. Father, we thank you uh, that you have given us a sign Through John the Baptist, he points beyond himself uh, to the one that's even greater. Uh, And it's you, Jesus. Uh, You are the greatest. You are the king. You rule over all things. Uh, Even in the midst of a world that's broken and our our leaders are broken and our... uh, Uh, Just the systems of this world are broken. Uh, We are moving toward a kingdom that is not broken, that is bringing healing into this world. And so uh, we ask, Lord, that as we take communion, that we would be reminded that we, of our baptism, that we would be reminded that we've said yes to you and joining you in your world healing purposes through Christ-like love and forgiveness and mercy and kindness and gentleness uh, and being a light in the darkness as you are to us all, Lord. So thank you, uh, despite our problems and our brokenness, that you welcome us at the table anyways. Uh, And help us, Lord, to have that same mentality, that same mindset with all people in this world. Uh, Yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever, Lord. Amen.